And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm, parallel, ne- parallel network built upon a foundation of truth, peace, and voluntarism, uh, to visit Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com, uh, or consider joining our Pasnia Committee of Correspondence on Telegram. Uh, that's t.me forward slash Pasnia Chats. Uh, we also have our first event of year three, uh, 2023, coming up. Uh, all vetted Pasnians and self-liberators are encouraged to attend our spring gathering from April 13th to 17th, happening in just about a month here at the Veritas Node of the Free Republic. Come out and celebrate the arrival of the warm weather in our nature sanctuary, our Church of Self-Liberation, uh, with other freedom pioneers. And uh, pertinent to this conversation, uh, you can try out our aqua cure and uh, learn all about this liberating, uh, miraculous thing that is Brown's gas and hydrogen. Uh, anyway, we hope to see you there, uh, and if you uh, need help getting vetted, uh, just email coordinator at paznia.com, uh, or again, you can find me on Telegram. So today we've got our third episode in our Breakthrough Energy for the Second Realm series. Uh, already we've talked to Sky Huddleston, who gave us the rundown on his Liberator rocket heater and coming Tesla turbine, along with his newest Breakthrough Energy project, uh, I guess his new uh, model of the Bork engine. Uh, we talked to Matt Presti, former president of the University of Philosophy and Science, uh, who stopped by to give us a cosmological foundation for breakthrough energy uh, via the Secret of Light uh, and the work of Walter Russell. Uh, it's been amazing so far, and it will get even better today uh, as we welcome back George Wiseman, uh, creator of the Aquacure, pioneer of uh, Brown's gas and hydrogen technology uh, going back to, you know, back to the 80s or, or, or whenever, and uh, someone who's been a true godsend to the passing departments of health and wellness. Uh, so as a reminder, if you visit vanupodcast.com forward slash aqua, that's vanupodcast.com forward slash aqua and place an order for your own aqua cure uh, using the coupon code vanu. Uh, you can save around 500 bucks and uh, George will be so kind as to send us some money in return. So again, uh, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash aqua and uh, use coupon code vanu. Uh, and if you're new to George and the aqua cure, just stay tuned. We'll, we'll definitely get into that a bit today. So um, yeah, first off, George, welcome back to the Vani podcast. Uh, and secondly, again, thank you for all that you do generally and uh, um, specifically for your generosity and assistance for what we've been able to accomplish here at the Pazian Department of Health and Wellness. So um, hello, and uh, how are you doing today? Wow, it's been really busy. I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me on your uh, podcast. I'm uh, very appreciative for uh, these sort of platforms so I can help a lot more people. And and educate things that uh, otherwise people really don't. And I've obviously seen you. You've been doing that, having some other really good people on. Uh, but otherwise, people really don't learn about this stuff. It's it's crazy. We have to go this route, but we can go this route. So we're doing it. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm I'm really happy to be here and very busy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear. So I guess first off, um, let's get into some some Aquacure stuff. Um, I'll uh, um, I, I guess I could go I'd go ahead and do the uh, the testimonial, um, or I guess what I what I, I put together last night. But um, so yeah, it's been about a year of uh, of the only water we drink being Brown's gas bubbled water, uh, and about a year straight of breathing the gas. Uh, and a few months back, I even started taking the machine into the bedroom with me and uh, breathe for three or four hours, as, as long as the cannula stay on. They don't usually stay on all night, but you know I think four hours is four hours is pretty decent. So, um, but sometimes all night too. Um, for me now, the aqua cure is what I call a lifestyle anchor. Uh, it's something that no matter what I do day to day, as long as I drink the water and breathe the gas, uh, I know I'll be healthy, even if I stray a bit out of balance. Uh, alongside the aqua cure and the lifestyle anchor roll are things like fulvic minerals, uh, kefir, raw milk, and uh, as of late, uh, B complex. Um, so yeah, B vitamins are, are kind of scarce in the food supply nowadays. But um, yeah, anyway, George, the, the overall t- overall testimonial is this: uh, after drinking the aqua cure, aqua, aqua cure water, no other water compares. Uh, we're transforming the consulate uh, into the embassy in the coming years. And um, I had a crazy thought: I'd love to find some sort of way to have all of our well water ran through a Brown's gas electrolyzer, uh, and have all the water we come in contact with be this magically electrically. Ex- electrically expanded water so maybe we can talk about that uh, today too if, if there's time at the end but uh, um, I mentioned Matt Presti earlier and uh, he provided a solid explanation of uh, the magic of hydrogen uh, and transmutation um, basically I guess and, and I'll badly paraphrase this pop 
uh, properly. But essentially, the universe is light, electricity, and when combined with hydrogen, um, it can it creates every element. So if you replicate the pressure conditions, you can literally create gold from water, or in the case of the aqua cure, if you put gold electrodes on there and repl replicate the pressure conditions. I imagine you could you could probably um, <laughs> create gold with that. So um, anyway, um, lots of lots there, but. Uh, um, the last thing I'll say is that this doesn't even touch the energy discussion, energy potentialities that we're going to we're going to we're, we're investigating here and that we're going to talk about today. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it's a big it's one of our one of our biggest focuses um, for basically all sorts of avenues. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, I'll turn it over to you if you have anything anything in, in response. I, I um, okay, <laughs> the the Aquacure. All right, let's just do a quick history. Mm -hmm. I uh, when Please I first started my research business. I, I, uh, I started Eagle Research in 1984. I started researching as an alternative energy researcher, and I started researching the uh, Brown's gas in 1986. I had before that understood electrolysis and, and just like any high school chemistry kind of thing. So I knew how to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And what I was hearing about the Brown's gas defied my knowledge. Now, okay, I was a young man. But what kind of knowledge did I have? But it still, it wasn't normal. You, if you weren't getting, there was something different. So I started researching it, uh, building, and I don't just do research, I do practical applications, which I can see a lot of the guys that you are uh, speaking with do as well. So that's good. Uh, that's, that's what we really need and looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I started out with, uh, I, I wanted Brown's gas as a torch, uh, electrolyzers as a torch fuel gas to replace uh, acetylene and MAP gas in my shop because supposedly the gas could weld plastic to titanium and things like that, which it can't, by the way. But that's that's <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of myths that were floating around at the time, and that's why I wanted one in my shop because as an inventor, I build things that aren't on the shelf. I need to know all these different kinds of welding techniques and things and have those kind of tools in my shop. So it turns out that it does have a lot of good welding uh, techniques. I haven't used uh, acetylene since 1980s, no, sorry, sorry uh, 96. I haven't used acetylene in my shop since 1996. Uh, once I got large enough electrolyzers uh, built and, and was using them, I, I, the only time I ever turn on a torch fueled by acetylene is to compare the flame to a Brown's gas flame. But virtually everything that a acetylene flame can do, the Brown's gas can do better, which is good. And, and so it was paid for itself that way. Of course, at that point, I was about a quarter million dollars into the research and development. So I paid a pretty good price to have that in my shop. But in the in the meantime, we learned a lot of other things. Like I was I'm also as an alternative energy researcher. I do a lot of fuel savers and my fuel savers work. I don't call anything a fuel saver unless it can gain at least 25 percent on most vehicles it's applied to. And one of the fuel savers that we developed because Everything was going from carbureted to fuel injection back in those days. And I was a, a carburation expert at the time, so I had to become a fuel injection expert as well, uh, was the Brown's gas electrolyzers. So with a little bit of Brown's gas put in with the air going into the engine, you could get a major bump in the uh, efficiency of fuel combustion. And we had to add a few additional things uh, to fool, I say fool, to change the voltage output like from the oxygen sensor because you end up with more oxygen in the exhaust. So therefore the fuel injection system thought that the fuel mixture was lean and it would rich in the mixture negating your gains. So we made a little device called the E5, which went on the uh, uh, voltage line coming, signal coming from the oxygen sensor. So we would correct the voltage back to what it's supposed to be and the fuel injection system wouldn't uh, therefore increase fuel uh, consumption again. And you get all your gains in power and engine uh, not only engine economy but engine life because if you burn the fuel in the engine rather than in the exhaust uh, and burn it completely in the engine you don't get all the carbon buildup and and that sort of thing in the engine that destroys it so mm. uh, more efficient combustion also means longer engine life for the most part so but in 1996 about the time i was selling these uh, large water torches uh, what i called water torches large browns gas electrolyzers one of my customers decided to bubble the uh, Brown's gas in water and uh, and then took that Brown's gas bubbled water and put it on a melanoma on his forehead. Uh, and of course, skin cancer is one of the very worst. And in three weeks time, his melanoma was gone. He just kept re-wetting the cotton ball in a plastic cap. And, and so really high tech. Mm. <laughs> but 
Now, I didn't believe him at the time because I was working with a torch fuel gas. I was uh, working with a gas that explodes and, and burns. And I had no idea whatsoever of the health aspect. But, at, but I did send out a, um, a notice to everyone who had been buying my technology. It was on my email list that this was a potential uh, uh, use for the gas. And testimonials started to come in. So by uh, 2005, my customers convinced me to bubble water in the uh, in uh, Brown's gas in the water and start drinking the water myself. So from 2007, because I tried it on myself for a couple of years first and, and found that it was good and I didn't get sick anymore. In fact, I haven't been sick uh, except for a couple of sniffles three times. It's so memorable that even when I get sniffles, I, I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, from uh, 2005 when I started drinking the Brown's gas bubbled water. But uh, a lot of my other ailments still continued to progress. I had uh, neuropathies and heart murmur, and, uh, and back then I was wearing glasses and a lot, of, a lot of different things. I had scars on my body. So all these kind of things ended up being gone. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. So I was drinking the water from uh, 2005. I recommended other people to start drinking the water using my machines. That one was called an ER50 back in the day. And they, they were drinking the water from that and sending in testimonials and asking me, can we inhale the gas? And I was, and at that point I was, again, used to the gas being a combustible gas and explosive and things and thinking that an explosion in the lungs would not be a good idea. So I advised people, misadvised people not to inhale the gas. And I'm very sorry about that. I was wrong. In, uh, in December of 2015, a customer sent me a video of a Korean hydrogen bar that was using Brown's gas machines to inhale, just like I'm doing here now. And so I could see, and, and that's when the lightning bolt and the hand slap on the forehead happened. And I think, oh, I know if I know about combustion and I know that if you have a mixture, it has a, something called a lower explosion limit. If you keep the hydrogen under the lower explosion limit in the mixture, which in this case is about four to four point seven percent hydrogen in air, uh, it's non-explosive, and you can inhale it quite nicely, which I'm doing here at about a two percent hydrogen mixture. Mm -hmm. So we have a situation where I could I could then test it on myself, which I did in March of 2016, and there's a video online that you can go look at, and look at that video in, on my YouTube channel and compare it to the face you're looking at right now. Put up two screens, compare them together and see which one looks younger. March of 2016 or now in, uh, what is this? March of, oh my goodness, 2023. 2023. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time just keeps passing faster and faster it seems. Anyway, so people did start to inhale the gas and it's been, uh, it, I have, my life has just gotten more and more busy since then as I've been working really hard to make machines to uh, these AquaCure machines, which it developed into. So from the ER50, uh, my wife, my current wife said, nobody's going to uh, buy those. It looks like a nerd, nerd experiment, a science experiment. So uh, guys like us might do it, but no woman would want to have that in the house. So then she said, okay, we have to make a machine that... Uh, women would want to have in the house if you want to have this in every house in the in the world and and I, and I do so i spent quite a lot of money and found out how to build a machine that would meet worldwide uh, 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 uh safety standards of uh, commercial safety standards and then uh and the full functionality and efficacy and all the kinds of things that the aquacure can do so i did that and uh, it's been modified, upgraded as thousands of people were buying them and I was getting back results. Uh, there were things like the site tube would cloud up. So I added a yellow LED that would shine when, the, uh, when it was time to refill the machine, things like that. So we made the machine better and better as time went on. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it hasn't changed actually for almost two years now. We've, we've, we've uh, dialed in a really good machine for people uh, to... Uh, receive the health benefits and therapeutic benefits of the Brown's gas and 
virtually every ailment known to man. There's now thousands of scientific studies out there on hydrogen for health. And Brown's gas is mainly hydrogen. I guess we should go into quickly what yeah, Brown's yeah, gas is. Yeah, we should. Yeah, for sure. Brown's, yeah, Brown's gas is 67% hydrogen. So everything that hydrogen can do, all the studies you see for hydrogen, Brown's gas can do as well. But Brown's gas is also 33% oxygen. So that's the total mixture when you're looking at the atomic uh, level of it. Our bodies are 62% hydrogen. So hydrogen is our major macronutrient. Our bodies are 24% oxygen, 12% carbon, and 2% everything else. So we have a situation where we got it, uh, our major macronutrient isn't being given normally because we normally get hydrogen from our food and our digestive systems have been compromised. So with uh, like the bacteria in them have been killed by antibiotics and, and glyphosate and artificial sweeteners and a whole bunch of things that we end up eating and, and, and absorbing in our environment. Mm -hmm. And the, and so we're not getting the hydrogen from our food that we should. And that's why we age and, and are getting all these cancers and uh, autoimmune diseases and all these other kinds of things that are caused by a deficiency of hydrogen. So as hydrogen ends up being deficient, I'll get back to what Brown's gas is in just a second, but mm -hmm. as hydrogen gets defi uh, deficient, uh, the body starts shutting down things it doesn't immediately need in order to preserve life. Like people are, are aware of the body's ability to preserve life. Like if you're in the cold, uh, it'll start shutting down blood flow to your extremities if you start to get uh, too cold to, to preserve core temperature, okay? Similar thing, if you're deficient in a particular uh, nutrient, it'll start shutting down systems that aren't immediately life-threatening, like your uh, stem cell systems, your uh, regeneration systems. And then eventually, if, it, if that isn't enough, it'll start shutting down your immune systems. Be, just to maintain the very basic things that life needed so you can get away from a saber-toothed tiger or whatever the case may be. Um, but because it isn't immediately life-threatening and then if you, you still don't have enough hydrogen your organs start to fail and then you die just from literally a lack of a nutrient so the opposite happens when you do the, the hydrogen supplementation is that your organs heal your immune systems turn back on your regeneration system turns back on i don't have a scar anywhere in my body i used to have a half centimeter scar right here on my forehead and if I wrinkle my head just right, you can kind of see where it was because the wrinkles still are there, but the scar is gone. And I had large scars elsewhere on my body. I grew up on a cattle ranch and you know, <laughs> tore myself a, a few times and, and mm -hmm. said, okay, so we get back to what Brown's gas is and why Brown's gas is more important or therapeutic than just hydrogen. So Brown's gas has hydrogen. It'll do everything hydrogen can do. Plus it has a combination, uh, six different, combinations of hydrogen and oxygen. It's got H2, which is your major hydrogen. It's got O2, which is your major oxygen, like you inhale from the air. It's got uh, electrically expanded water. We'll be back to that in just a second. It's got water vapor, which is just H2O, is steam or water vapor. It's got a very small amount, about one to 3% of H, which is atomic hydrogen, and O, which is atomic oxygen. And But we just ignore those for the time being. They're not significant. The point is it has these six constituents. The magic constituent is the electrically expanded water. So it's literally just water, water like you, you, you normally drink, but it's absorbed electrons until it's become a gaseous form of water that is not water vapor or steam. It's still H2O, but it has extra electrons. So you could say H2O negative because electrons are negatively charged. So we have, and that's important when we go to measure it in very scientific experiments, we can measure this negative charge. So in any case, it turns out that the, uh, the, the electrically expanded water does a huge number of things in the body. The body knows how to heal if it's given, the body can heal if it's given two different things. It's given its nutrients and energy. It already knows how to heal. So like heal wounds or whatever the case may be. And a scar is just a patch. It, it, so instead of healing it, it just patched it, for example. Mm -hmm. So we get back to, uh, the hydrogen is your important nutrient, your most important macronutrient, but it needs energy. Hydrogen by itself is neutral. It, it's like a brick. It sits there. It doesn't do anything. It needs energy and intelligence to put it where it belongs. And that's where the electrically expanded water comes in because it's giving the body energy. Bodies that have, have become nutritionally deficient often have 
used up their energy reserves and their energy generation systems have become compromised. So you end up healing a lot faster if you have the electrically expanded water in addition to the hydrogen. And that's why the Brown's gas is proving to be about, in, in scientific experiments, 30% more therapeutically effective than just straight hydrogen. But, uh, okay, so that's what Brown's gas is and why you would want it. But the AquaCure does have more maintenance involved than uh, just a regular hydrogen only machine like uh, has been around for 200 years. So we have a, sy a system where you, you end up having to uh, clean out the sludge because sludge is a byproduct of the, of the uh, Brown's gas production. Now we can get into talking about transmutation fairly quickly here because mm -hmm. you have an audience that loves that. Yep, sure do. Okay, and this, and, this, and this is what happens is that sludge that's in the machine isn't degrading plates or de decomposing plates or anything like that. It's actually a byproduct of the new water that's formed during electrolysis, specifically in a Brown's gas machine. And that new water can actually transmute into virtually any element on earth. So when they're saying hydrogen is your basic first element, that's absolutely correct. And every other element comes from that. And we can prove that with this, with this uh, water technique. So, which is hydrogen and oxygen, but when you do the new water, uh, it ends up being, it, it combines with the hydrogen effect in there. It makes a sludge, a brown sludge. And that brown sludge, if you analyze it, has all the elements that are inside that machine, mostly the stainless steel electrodes and stuff like that. But one electrolyzer, for example, that we had, one of my ER-1200 water torches, uh, was being used by a chiropractor, and the testimonials he was getting were just incredible. Okay? And he was using it eight hours a day, and once a year, we would clean the sludge out. And over a period, I think it was three years' time, I, I saved that sludge from that particular one. I'm not sure why that particular one, but I did. <laughs> and it, it accumulated 19 pounds of sludge. <laughs> Turns out that the, coincidentally, the electrodes in the electrolyzer uh, weighed 19 pounds. They, that's what they weigh when they're new. They still weighed 19 pounds after the third clean out. So the sludge didn't come from the uh, electrodes themselves or any decomposing anything in there. And he only ever put distilled water into the machine. So where did this 19 pounds of stuff come from? And what is it? So we had it analyzed and literally it was every element that is in stainless steel was in that 19 pounds of sludge. Hmm. So it literally was transmuting the water into the elements that were in its uh, vicinity. It got the information when this new water was forming, it would get the information around it and it would, it would just form the new water. Another similar experiment, um, it was an accidental experiment, but luckily uh, Joseph Bender was paying attention. There's a fellow, he owned a, a company called Rainfresh and, uh, an exp and a Brown's gas uh, expert called Norman Wooten happened to be uh, there and they were do making new water. And at that point, all they were doing was taking the uh, flame from the torch. And when the flame burns, the, the condensation of that is water, is new water. Okay, the same water as new water. Also happens to be deuterium depleted water for those that are interested in doing that. So the flame from the torch uh, makes the new water, which is deuterium depleted water. And he was storing that water in a bottle, at a plastic bottle that he set up on a shelf in the sunshine. Uh, happened to be sitting next to a bottle of vitamin of minerals, because not vitamin, just mineral supplements. There's 50 different minerals in this in this bottle, and supposedly every day you take a like a tablespoon of this and you swallow it to get your minerals. Okay, in any case, sediment started to form in this bottle that had nothing but new water in it nothing but h2o period there was nothing else in this bottle and this white sediment started to form well they test this sediment and about 10 ounces of it formed by the way okay and in, in there was must have been about two cups of water in there and 10 ounces of it formed of this white sediment that white sediment when it was tested had all 50 of those elements in it that were in that jar next to it and the, wow. the light from the sunshine was shining through the uh the 50 element bottle and impressing the uh, information on the on the new water so there's a couple of uh, i have several other stories as well but you, the transmutation with brown's gas is a proven fact that these days so in any case when you're doing the aqua cure and you need that you have to occasionally do this maintenance cleanup 
I have had it suggested that I put gold electrodes in there and people pay extra for that. And then when they get their sludge, they can, you know, they <laughs> just have to <laughs> put it in a crucible and they can have gold. There you go. So I, I haven't personally done that experiment myself, but it has been suggested. And there are, yeah. there are people out there that want to, want to do that. So uh, I, I've been talking a long time. Do you guys have any questions? <clears throat> Um, I mean, this is, it's all, it's all been great so far. And, uh, I love the additional, um, addition, tra additional transmutation example. Um, that's, uh, that's amazing. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's definitely, um, it makes me think, um, because do Dr. Barry Lando has talked about, um, impressing, you know, like the 12 cell salt waveforms in water. You don't actually have to have any substance. And it sounds like I, I was boggled, I was boggled my mind how that would actually, you know, work. And I guess you just kind of gave an example of how it could possibly work. So, um, or at least one one way to, to test it out. So that's, um, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. So I guess just one one question, um, uh, I guess but one, one uh, yeah, I guess one question regarding the Aquacure. Um, I know you talked about, um, I guess maybe maybe it was the uh, the um, deuterium depleted water attachment or something along those lines. But uh, what what are I guess uh, any any plan any new plans for for the Aquacure? I guess uh, anything in development. Um, and I guess maybe you could talk about the the class that you're that you're offering too. Um, I guess last time we talked. Or the other course? Uh, yes. Sorry, my my uh, camera seems to be having some difficulties. <laughs> the um, or or computer bandwidth or something. Anyway, anyway. Um, nevertheless, the Aquacure. I do intend to continue selling it uh, as is. I want to have a course so that I can get more assemblers out there because my own shop can only do a few hundred a month. <clears throat> I already have one student who is also now doing a few hundred a month. And hopefully we can get this so we're doing thousands and thousands of these aquacures a month. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, direction that we're headed in right now. Because there's no way that any one uh, company, maybe an Elon Musk, I don't know, but uh, I don't want to be an Elon Musk. But we still want to get these this Browns Gas technology out into as many homes as possible. So we're, we're making a course that will help people be assemblers of these machines so they can support their own local communities and stuff. That's one one of the plans that we have. Another one is to uh, make attachments for the Aquacure. One of the attachments would be this deuterium depleted water that we were just talking about. We can make the new water, which is also deuterium depleted water. And that new water could also then be made into fuel and medicine and uh, materials. Like if they have a lithium shortage, hey, we can make our own. <laughs> All of these kind of things that can uh, possibly happen. Of course, I, I think if everybody in their own home can make gold, uh, the, the banks might have a problem with that. So there's, there's probably some changes going to be coming down the, down the pike at some point. Yeah. Other, I was briefly curious about your experiment with the gold. Um, did it produce a sludge, like a white sediment at the bottom? I, I haven't yet done the experiments with the, doing the uh, okay. transmutation. I'm right. curious what form of gold it would precipitate, but yeah, continue. Right. Well, they've got the, uh, um, monatomic gold or ormus or there's a whole bunch yeah. of things that are out there technologies that are right. can kind of tie into this so another uh, uh attachment that we want to do is something we call the lord's pump now I, this is a where you use the browns gas from the aquacure to fuel a pistonless pump which supposedly according to the experiments that other people have done and i and i only i only got a half built in my shop right now before i got too busy to continue but the, the energy to make the browns gas is only a tenth of the energy that you'd get back out of the pump. So you can literally have a free energy machine in every home using the browns gas. So the, and a relatively small uh, footprint as well. I'm also working on uh, gravity wheels, which uh, unfortunately they're, they, there's not much energy density there. So you have to have a very large wheel to get very much energy out of it. But the, uh, assuming that it works. I, I think I have two designs now that, that might work and I'm finishing up the design and hopefully build them and, and have them in operation by this time next year. But at, at the moment, several of these Lord's pumps have been built and tested uh, and supposedly make 10 times more energy. So you can, when you're, when they're uh, mechanically up there. So we run it through uh, a Pelton wheel. So in other words, you're pumping water with a pistonless pump. I'll get into the action just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you're running it through a turbine, a, melt, a Pelton wheel, and that's running a generator. And you can take electricity from that generator, essentially one tenth of it, run it back to make the Browns gas, which continues the process. And then nine tenths uh. or 
even with uh, inefficiencies of the generator and, and Pelton wheel, perhaps we're looking at 60 or 70 percent of it uh, goes out as free electricity, which you can use to reverse your electric meter or turn on your own lights or whatever the case may be. So we could, except for these smart meters, they make them so they don't reverse. <laughs> that was smart of them. I was, mm -hmm. uh, I actually, when I was uh, back in the woods and I had a farm that had a, a spring up on the mountain, especially in the springtime, with all the runoff, there was a lot of extra water coming down the mountain. So I had a two inch pipe going to a Pelton wheel, dry, overdriving a, a standard motor, and that would reverse my electric meter totally in phase. So uh, a synchronous uh, uh, generator, if you will. And it would it would charge up enough electricity at uh, running my, reversing my electric meter that for several months, uh, I'd have a credit on my uh, electric, but I was doing it gorilla fashion, which they I, I didn't have a contract with the uh, utility or anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, it, but they only checked the electricity. They just estimated how much my use was generally, and they would only check the electric actual meter once every two or three times a year, actually, and then just do a correction, whatever the case may be. But they came in too soon one time, <laughs> and they uh, and they and it was negative. In other words, the, the meter reading was less than the last time they had checked it. And so what they did was they uh, they replaced the meter thinking it was broken or something. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, that, that's just one of the stories from my youth. In any case, you can do similar things like that. Not with the smart meters, but right now on this house, I have a contract with my utility and I have a 24 kilowatt solar system on my roof. So any excess electricity that I generate uh, goes back into the uh, as a credit onto my account. They don't actually pay me for it, but it's a net metering kind of a thing in that then uh, I, I can use that. It's like having a great big battery bank, if you will. I have batteries as well, like when the power goes out, so my lights don't go out. But but I, I can store as much electricity as is generated in the summertime and then use it whenever I need it the rest of the year kind of thing. A person can do a similar thing with the gravity wheel in that it would turn at a constant rate. And the same with this Lord's pump, it would turn at a constant rate, it just maximizing its power. And then you can store the extra power for, and you don't need as large a machine. Like the average that I'm using is about four kilowatts an hour in this house and in my shop and stuff. So if I had a, a one kilo, kilowatt machine generating um, during, sorry, so if I had a solar system that was doing like uh, 12 kilowatts, then during during a peak in the in the sun, then it would have four kilowatts as a general all the, all day long. I, mm -hmm. I have all my own power. So the the idea is you can have a smaller unit because you use power in surges. Like I I may go up to uh, 24 kilowatts in a surge if everything is turned on, kind of thing. Uh, but if I have a four kilowatt generator. Uh, say it's storing up the power, then I can have the power there necessary to meet that demand should it happen in, in the peaks and surges, which which happen when motors start and things like that. Okay, back to the to the Lord's pump. So what's happening is you have a cylinder. You can just think of it as a cylinder uh, somewhat similar to this. And the, the uh, Brown's gas is being put in the top. And as the Brown's gas gets put in the top, it pushes the water level down. There's a little bit of pressure in there. There is a valve, uh, a, a hose that comes out one side that has a check valve that only allows the water to go out. And there's a hose coming in on this side that has a check valve that only allows the water to come in. So if you explode the gas that's up here, it creates a pressure which pushes down on the liquid level, spurting the, the water out this side here. And then this turns into a vacuum. As soon as the Brown's gas uh, explodes, it, it, it contracts into water uh, 1,860 times. So it makes an almost perfect vacuum up here. And that vacuum sucks water in from this side. So suddenly the uh, chamber fills up. Now as the chamber's filling up, I'm also putting a little more Brown's gas in from the top. So there's a point you can adjust the, um, the uh, ratios where you've got your Brown's gas, you've got your water, and you fire the Brown's gas again, and it pushes down. So then the cycle repeats. It's a pistonless pump because the combustion oh. is acting directly on the water level oh, itself. My, yeah. And these are uh, pistonless pumps have, have been used a long time, generally using a fuel like natural gas or something like that to pump water 
like in uh, England. If you if you research that, you'll see they, they have great, huge pistonless pumps and, uh, and they're very simple to operate. Now, that pressure that's going out would then drive a Pelton wheel. OK, the jet of water uh, spins the turbine, which is then powering the generator, which is making the electricity or alternator, as the case may be. And it, it's just a simple system like that. And of course, as the water falls out of the bottom of the Pelton wheel, it goes into a reservoir that then uh, gets drawn from uh, to uh, continue cycling the water through the system. So it doesn't necessarily have to be water. It can be almost any fluid because the water itself has nothing to do with it, except that it's a convenient uh, medium for this uh, uh, jet of water, a uh, jet of uh, fluid to uh, run the Pelton wheel. So that, that's an additional attachment that I thought your listeners would be interested in that the AquaCure can do. It can provide the Browns gas for things like that as well. And any other questions? No, that's that's amazing. I I I can't remember if we talked about this before, but I I, I don't think we have really at least in that in in that depth. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. I'm thinking about parts uh, p- parts here on the homestead. Um, we get a lot of rain, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of deep ravines. Um, and um, you know, people you know talk mentioned hydropower, and it's like, yeah, I don't know about a hydropower system, but like or you know hydro, I don't know about that. But as like that Browns gas setup, um, that seems more more feasible. So I, I'm curious, what are your thoughts, Bueller? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm really interested actually in the pistonless, uh, motor design, uh, now that I've got a kind of a basic understanding of how it works. And, um, there's definitely no doubt about the health and wellness aspects of, uh, not only the AquaCure, but like Brown's gas itself and as well as the transmutation possibilities. Um, but I'm also really interested in like uh, power generation as well. And so these different engine designs are, uh, I find very interesting. But I'm also kind of curious about some of these conversions that I've seen. So um, yes, people can uh, help like run their automobiles uh, off of Brown's gas, but they can also like generate their own electrical power as well. And I've seen uh, conversions with like a, a regular gas power generator where people will convert it over to Brown's gas. And uh, my dad's actually working on one of those right now. So I can't wait to see how that turns out. But um, as far as like the AquaCure itself goes, um, I'm curious how much gas it can produce and like what amperage that it operates at and what amperage do you think is ideal to run a torch? Uh, Good questions. Okay, so the AquaCure uses about 250 watts. Uh, At 220 volts, it draws about um, which is about 240 volts, 220, 240. It draws about an amp and the uh, uh, from the wall, and at 120, it draws about two amps, just over. So okay. the so the it it's very low power as far as that's concerned. It makes uh, about 800 milliliters per minute of Brown's gas, which equates to about 60 liters an hour of uh, Brown's gas. So it, it's not large. Uh, it it's large enough for therapeutic use. Um, If you want to do uh, enough Brown's gas to power uh, or to fuel a a normal acetylene torch to do normal acetylene work, then that takes about Mm -hmm. 1,200 liters per hour. So the AquaCure does 660, but uh, for for, uh, actually fueling a torch, you need 1,200. And at that point, you're drawing something in the range of 25 amps at 220 volts. uh, Okay. Machines. So the uh, I, I have gotten the efficiency, the wattage efficiency in my lab of making Brown's gas down to under one watt hour per liter. OK, now the, the mm-hmm. AquaCure is running somewhere around four, four and a half watt hours per liter. And, and that's pretty much industry standard out there. But there are experimental things that you can do to lower the amount of electricity needed to split the water. Unfortunately, uh, they're, they're a little expensive. So for practicality's sake, I, I can't put them out. It can, and you don't really need it. Like when you're when you're drawing 250 watts, that's that's about the same as uh, uh, three light bulbs. <laughs> you know, it's it's not uh, uh, very expensive, and and it's practical to uh, to have that. I have to call it inefficiency, because back in the day, the with the first very the very first Brown's gas machines were taking 17 watt hours to make a liter of gas. So we've come a long ways bringing it down to four watt hours to make a liter of gas. So, but there's there's ways that it can be 
still increase to bring it down to less than one watt hour per liter of gas. And and so that that answers the uh, wattage questions and the volume question, I believe. Was there, mm -hmm. I think there was one other one in there? Um, I was asking about like the ideal specifications for running a torch. And so maybe like say the ER50 or something like the ER1200 would be more suited for that? Well, the ER1200 would be suited for running a, a, lar a regular sized acetylene torch. The, the ER50 uh, is does have a micro torch that goes with it. And mm -hmm. that micro torch makes a micro flame. And that micro flame is actually quite powerful. It'll do... Uh, soldering and brazing and uh, and and uh, annealing and quite a lot of things, just in a very small scale. So if you're doing jewelry work or uh, like right, uh, soldering yeah. your glasses together, like your metal frame glasses, I, I actually did that for my brother, uh, and and his glasses broke, so I soldered that together. Things just small jobs like that, the AquaCure actually is powerful enough to do. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to actually building a, an, an electrolyzer that can be more dedicated to torch usage so that we're not using our health and wellness aquacure for the torch all the time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm looking at starting small and then maybe working my way up from there to see what the torch is capable of. Yes. And if you're if you're actually building just for torch work, you don't need all the safety uh, things that I build into the aquacure. So you can you could go and get my Brown's Cast book two and build just a, a out of plastic and stuff. You can build something a whole lot less cost and get very efficient and highly effective browns gas for your torch. No problem. It, that's that's what I would recommend if you if you want to do that. It, yeah, it, I'll definitely include that with uh, with uh, the material that I'm looking through. Um, but yeah, eventually, I guess you can work your way up to um, synthesizing gems through the uh, flame fusion process, which was I guess developed using HHO flames. So, yeah, I guess for over 100 years now, they've been lab creating gems using Brown's gas torches. Yes, uh, hydrogen, it, and they, they may call it Brown's gas, but it, it and, it, and hydrogen oxygen or oxyhydrogen torches are what right. They, oxyhydrogen they, is what I've yes. typically heard it called. Yes. And, uh, and, and yes, what they're doing is you can uh, cook various min, uh, minerals together and make like rubies and sapphires and emeralds and things like that. Uh, one of the early ones that I did with the Brown's gas was called Moonstone. I made a transparent version of Moonstone, which only the transparent version of Moonstone only happens, as far as I know, uh, somewhere in the Nordic countries. There's there's a place where you can uh, mine. It's quite rare, naturally. Moonstone, yeah. yes. But if you take um, corundum, I think it is. Yes. Uh, and yes, it's you, corundum. And you, and you just simply cook it with the Brown's gas. It actually cooks out like if there's any iron or anything in there it actually vaporizes that and cooks it out and once the bubbling stops and stuff you let this little thing cool down and you can shape it into any shape you want uh now it isn't it isn't uh crystalline moonstone it's amorphous but it is the same uh chemical structure it has the same strength and all that kind of thing uh mm -hmm. you've got this little transparent thing it looks like a piece of glass but it's moonstone yeah i love it i'm looking forward to trying all that Oh, oh, oh I, I'm sorry. Uh, Corundum is the one that makes uh, sapphires, rubies. It makes ruby and, and sapphire, it's, uh, it's yes. feldspar, feldspar. You cook feldspar. About 30% of the Earth's crust is made of feldspar. And if you cook that, that's what makes the uh, moonstone. So you have to be careful. Right. When you said Corundum, yeah. I thought you were going to mention rubies and sapphires. Right. So the difference in the color in, the, in these ver those various stones has to do with the impurities that are in it whether it be red or yellow or green. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chromium in the case of uh, ruby and iron and titanium in the case of sapphire. Yes, those sort of yeah. things. So, um, yeah, that's just one of, one of many applications that uh, Brown's gas is capable of. Go ahead, Rio. Oh, yeah. So um, that's so we're talking about large, larger scale applications here. Um, and I mentioned in the introduction that like, just just a while thought, and I don't know how it would practically be done. Um, but like adding like a brown size generator um, to the inlet of like a house. Like, have you ever thought of something wild like that? Or I guess um, I, I guess the, the first thing that comes to mind is I don't know, like what would that I, I guess it, it wouldn't really. The, I guess the implosive nature wouldn't be that big of a deal since it'd be in water. But I don't know. What are, what are your initial thoughts? And have you heard, heard anyone uh, do that so far? That's that's a good idea. I think generally you don't need it for the whole house. Um, I would I would even an aquacure could do a pretty good job of uh, of putting the uh, gas in the water. 
unfortunately the gas doesn't stay in the water the right. gas even if, if it's in a pipe or a, a plastic hose or a metal pipe or something the or or plastic jug or metal jug or whatever the case may be the browns gas leaves the water leaves the jug the, the hydrogen is so small a molecule it actually slips right through the molecular structure of almost everything <laughs> so it, it will only stay in there for a short period of time so, so I, I still think it's best to bubble the water as you're going to drink it or as you're going to feed it to plants mm -hmm. because really it, it's the most uh, efficacious or useful when it's going to a living thing there i don't see any advantage uh not when you're bathing it's it's also good but you can bubble the bath water as yeah, you're as true. you're pouring in the tub and kind of thing but mm -hmm. uh so bathing showering would be a different story you could you could shower with the browns gas water it it does amazing things for skin so that that's it, it's a good idea but for cooking for example and uh, watering the well watering the lawn okay uh, watering the lawn you're putting it on the on the grass uh, but as soon as you start to cook uh, or boil or heat the gas or the water, uh, all the gases uh, escape. It gets rid of all the gases. In fact, that's one of the things I warn people about. When you're buying distilled water, uh, be sure to boil it to get rid of the ozone. A lot of distilled water has ozone in it, the distilled water you buy in the store. So if it doesn't, that's fine. But, but usually it does. And they don't have to list it as an ingredient. So you have to be careful uh, because we... We tell people to put uh, distilled water in the aquacure, but of course it has to be pure distilled water, not not water with that, that's ozonated. So um, yes, it is possible, and that's one of the uh, attachments. Thank you for reminding me that we're wanting to put on the aquacure is something called a uh, nano bubbling system. So what happens is it infuses like a hundred times more uh, Brown's gas into the water than you can just by uh, putting the gas into the interstitial spaces in between molecules. So you have whatever molecules are making up the water, usually hydrogen and oxygen water, and, and it'll have spaces in between it. And as the water gets colder, those spaces increase in size. It's one of the reasons because water expands as it cools and freezes. That's why ice floats on, on water. <clears throat> but as it heats up, the uh, and so as, as it gets colder, it can absorb more of that gas in, in those spaces. But as it, it heats up, those spaces get smaller and smaller, and it gets less and less gas until there's no gas at all. By the time you do a rolling boil of the water, there's no gas in the water. So it, it's important to use the Brown's gas in cool water, not, not uh, even cool water. If you heat it after, it just gets rid of the gases. So you can't make your porridge or, your, or cook with it or tea or coffee or anything like that and mm -hmm. expect you'll get a uh, gain from the hydrogen because it, it just won't happen. On the other hand, the uh, inhalation for 12 seconds puts as much water in your bloodstream as a fully infused 1.6 parts per million um, Brown's gas water. So mm -hmm. the, even though the water is important and it's important to bubble it, mainly because of the ORP, okay, oxygen reduction potential, what you want, what you're doing is adding a whole bunch of electrons to the water and making it negatively charged, if you will. So when you drink it, you actually get energy. It actually gives your body energy. Normally, if you drink uh, tap water, for example, it'll have a positive ORP, which means it's electron deficient. And when you drink that water, it actually sucks energy from your body to neutralize it. It actually, it's, so in a way it's dehydrating to, uh, to drink tap water. But this water here is not only hydrating; it it gives the body energy. Yeah, I know. So, I, I used to uh, always uh, I used to always get house. dehydrated drinking a lot of water, like bottled water, back when I used to. So. Yes. So you have to watch that uh, you get it uh, bubbled, so you have that low ORP. Low being negative, uh, it's actually a high ORP when you think of it's adding electrons, but uh, a negatively charged ORP, and then you'll feel, you'll just feel it. It'll feel smooth. It'll feel like your body wants to get that water into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess uh, one thing was we're talking, yeah, I guess um, more in the, I guess in the more general energy realm, um, talking about energy storage, uh, Bueller, I think you said you'd, you'd came across um, people who are storing the electric, electrically expanded water 
um, and uh, I guess the Browns gas would would bu- bubble off. But you could, I guess, could could you still use that for fuel? Um, you want to uh, fill us in on that, Bueller, and then I'd get your thoughts on that, George, if, if I could. I uh, yeah. yeah. So I have come across on YouTube um, a couple of uh, YouTube users, one of which is known by uh, the name Nighthawk. You might be familiar with him. Some of his tech stuff that he he does, the how bunch of how tos. But um, one of the things that he shows how to build is called a gasometer, which can be used to store like wood gas and various other things. But uh, he has also used it to store Brown's gas. Now, I know the it's probably not going to contain the hydrogen um, very long, but it's probably maybe good for a a medium to long term storage of uh, Brown's gas or electrically expanded water, at least at atmospheric pressure. Um, But I was curious how safe you think it would be to try to store it in pressurized tanks, like your normal CO2 type tank. I hadn't heard of Nighthawk. Thank you for letting me know. It sounds like a guy I definitely want to check out. Uh, I don't store, and that's a really good question, by the way. I don't store Brown's gas in any pressurized container whatsoever. Now, I used to blow mountains apart for a living, (laughs) believe it or not, Mm -hmm. when I worked in the mines, open pit mines. And I was on the blasting crew and got fully trained. So I have my blasting certifications. And I can tell you that the, the, the loudest explosion I ever had was a 70 PSI tank that I deliberately ignited to uh, out in a field to, uh, to see what would happen. And yeah, it went bang. It went bang big time. So you don't want to be anywhere near uh, a Brown's gas, a pressurized Brown's gas explosion. Now you can go on my YouTube channel and you can see where I have Brown's gas explosions in just pop bottles, just uh, two or three liter pop bottles. So it and and it's fine at low pressure. Even a pop bottle will contain the explosion. A balloon won't. A balloon will expand and, and burn and, and pop. But the, but a pop bottle is enough to uh, contain it. But as soon as you start pressurizing it, the explosion. Uh, uh, sharpness, if you will, goes up exponentially. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's not double the pressure, double the explosion. It's double the pressure. It's like five times the explosion. It just keeps going up by an exponential rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the more dense the gas is when it explodes, the, the, the more force it's going to take to, uh, or, or that it'll put on any particular chamber. So I definitely would not store uh, Brown's gas. I don't recommend storing Brown's gas at all. Uh, it, it's just like sitting next to a bomb. Uh, literally, <laughs> anything can set that off. If you have a static okay. electric spark hit the outside of your container, it can actually ignite the Brown's gas inside with, uh, let's get this right, um, conductive, uh, conductance. It's, uh, it, it, it uses the bottle itself like a, uh, uh, the middle of a capacitor. And so oh, it okay. transmits yeah. the uh, electrical impulse into the inside and the gas on the inside, the Brown's gas already has everything in it that it needs to explode, it's including mix. its own yeah. energy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if you compress the gas enough, it will self explode. Okay. And if there's a sharp, so if you don't, there's a certain point where you can only compress it. I think it's around, if you have no sharp edges whatsoever, or anything, it's somewhere around 150 PSI, something like that. But I wouldn't want to be anywhere within a block of, an, of, a, of a chamber. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay. that has 150 psi brown's gas in it back to the point uh i had a, a brown's gas electrolyzer that couldn't even be pressurized to uh seven psi without exploding inside and it turns out that when it was being manufactured a little curl of uh, metal like when you're when you're doing your drilling you know how the uh it makes a little curl with a sharp point on it a little burr yeah a little and, and that little curl of metal had landed in there with this little sharp point pointed upward. And that little sharp point was enough to concentrate the electrons, static electricity, that's already in the gas to the point where it would it would explode the gas at, at about the time it reached about five or six PSI. So that that so that, that electrolyzer just kept exploding and it came back from Australia. I sold that one to Australia <laughs> and shipped it back around the world to to uh, clean it out and find this little this little piece of sharp stuff, which once we took it out, it worked just fine. The machine just worked mm-hmm. just fine. Now I was running those machines at, at nine PSI maximum. And that's the torches that, that, that that's all the pressure you need to have the gas uh, properly fuel a uh, oxyacetylene torch. So 
that just gives you an experiment and, and you can look you can see instead of a spark plug there are a lot of ignition systems out there which are literally do just have a sharp point when the when the gases compress it that sharp point is enough to ignite the gases and with brown's gas that is certainly true by the way with the uh, with the brown's gas pump uh, the, the lord's pump you had a spark plug right in the middle and the uh, and the brown's gas beating into one side kind of thing so that you could ignite the gas whenever you need you wanted to with the spark and just as a heads up, the experiments that I want to uh, include uh, to make it more efficient include what's called plasma arc. Okay, you can look up Aaron, Aaron Mirakami's uh, work with plasma spark and also and plasma ignition, which vastly reduces the amount of fuel needed while increasing the uh, combustion uh, pressure and also something called um, uh, water fog, water fog explosions. So you, you probably are familiar with that or, or you can look it up. So I wanna combine the three technologies, the plasma spark, the Brown's gas and the water fog to see if I can get that efficiency of the Lord's pump up even higher. So uh, yeah, I definitely want to uh, check out this Nighthawk guy. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to my uh, Brown's gas experiments, I'll keep them at atmospheric pressure and I won't uh, try to store it for anything more than short term storage on uh, i create them on demand so like that's why you need a mm -hmm. fairly large uh, um, torch although i will say that there are times when your oxyacetylene when you're doing cutting for example i i made a different another apparatus for my cutting torch because uh the brown's gas is relatively cool flame compared to like thermally compared to acetylene right now it's a higher energy flame but mm -hmm. it depends on the material that's being a uh, uh Put against because that material will heat up to whatever it it takes to get rid of the electrons that are being put into it because the brown's gas flame is like an electrical flame not a thermal flame right okay yeah so what happens when you go to heat steel for example it takes quite a long time to heat the steel so what i did is i made an apparatus that i had a little electric switch on my um on my acetylene torch that i would just simply flick that switch and it would open an um uh, solenoid that would bypass the the valve for adjusting the, the amount of gas being done. So I would be doing like 200 liters an hour of gas through the regular valve in the torch to make a normal flame. So I'd open this other valve that would put like uh, 3,000 liters an hour through uh, just mm -hmm. all of a sudden a huge amount of Brown's gas. And that would heat up the steel almost instantly and then release the switch and I'm back to my 200 liters an hour, hit the oxygen and I'm cutting the steel. So that uh, just just a FYI heads up, there's additional things you can do to overcome the disadvantage of that slow heating. You just put in more gas. But I brought the reason it reminded me is that what I did was I would have another chamber off to the side of the electrolyzer where I'd be storing some gas at it's again, it's low pressure. It's only nine, nine PSI, but there was extra room so I could I could have that 3000 liters an hour for enough seconds to uh, to heat the the steel and then of course as soon as they went back to the 900 then the then the uh, machine would would start recharging that bottle and stuff so i'd have it uh, that reserve again when i needed it yeah interesting okay I, I see how i could probably use like an application like that that only would store like maybe 30 seconds worth of gas or something just to get that boost yeah so when it comes to engines I, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is about running brown's gas on engines and my mm -hmm. uh, my experiments so far, I have run Brown's gas on in, or engines on Brown's gas, but only from electrolyzers powered by the wall, not from electrolyzers. Like I, oh. I ran um, small engines like lawnmowers and things like that, and then I would run uh, larger engines like a, a 140 cubic inch engine that uh, I, I, my camera's again having some issues. I'm not sure what that's going on. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll come back soon. Anyway, the uh, 140 cubic inch en Vega engine, uh, it was using, I think it was drawing nine kilowatts from the wall at that point to idle the engine at 500 uh, RPM. Uh, so you had to have a lot of Brown's gas to use as a fuel. And, they, and so it, it can't just, um, you can't, or, or as far as I could find, I couldn't have an engine running that would be powering a generator, making the electricity necessary to make the Brown's gas to power the engine. 
I couldn't close that loop, not by a long shot. Okay. So regardless of the engine or the battery or alternator setup, it still wasn't quite enough. Right. Not, not even close. Okay. Not, All right. not, not by a long shot. So the, uh, and, and internal combustion engines generally are running only around 25 or 30% efficient kind of thing. So you're throwing away a lot of your power out the exhaust and, and, and things. So it's just using electricity, which is a high form of energy to make the Brown's gas to run it into uh, um, internal combustion engine, which is a low, low grade way of making power. Uh, it just wasn't a very efficient way of doing that. You're better off to, once you get your hydrogen, run it into a fuel cell or something like that to get your electricity. But the uh, but even then, it isn't over unity. Now, if we can make Brown's gas uh, really, and, and there have been people who have run engines on uh, water. This has happened. I don't know the key to it myself, but I've, I've accumulated, I think, about 10 different examples, and I... I have an idea of a couple of ways that it could possibly be done. Uh, one way is where, where we're talking about this Lord's pump thing, where we're in, introducing the plasma ignition and the, and the water fog uh, to increase the efficiency. So we'll, we'll see how all that works out. Nice. Okay. Mm, okay. Yeah. So I'm thinking it will probably take multiple different ways of increasing the efficiency of not only the electrolysis, but perhaps capturing the uh, the energy of the combustion as well. Yes. All right, then. Can you guys see so me? There's okay? still more work to do. Hmm? Can you guys see me okay? Um, I can see you. The camera's frozen, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, we can, can see you. But uh, I guess um, we'd be going for about an hour here, and uh, that's that's been that's all been really incredible so far. Um, but uh, and we covered it a little bit um, in, in previous uh, discussions. But um, let's talk a little bit about uh, application. I guess uh, um, applications for um, like uh, I guess fuel saver kits, and then potentially um, and then maybe I think you mentioned you had a vapor system, vapor system on one of your RVs. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that. Right. The uh, starting with the fuel system. What we have is with Brown's gas, we have, I call a Hyzor, Hyzor technology. And that's where I had to, when it was carbureted systems, where I was increasing the efficiency of uh, the fuel using what I call a carburetor enhancer, obviously no carburetor, we'd have to switch it over and uh, to a different kind of fuel saver for fuel injection. So then we, I invent, I developed the Brown's gas. Now it turns out that if you put a little bit of Brown's gas, about one to 5,000 ratio, so it doesn't take very much at all, in with the air going into the engine, it increases the efficiency of combustion of the, of the uh, carbon-based fuel. The fo uh, so um, they call it fossil fuels, but I call it carbon-based because I, I don't think we're burning dead dinosaurs. <laughs> I think the, act the, uh, the fuel, the oil is actually regenerated by the planet with other, we can talk oh, about yes. that. Oh, yes. Abiotic oil, yes. So in any case, uh, you've got your carbon-based fuel, and uh, in order to burn, you have to break apart the carbons from the hydrogens, very similar to what's happening in our digestive systems. In order to get our hydrogen from our food, uh, you have to break that apart. That, that energy uh, that is holding the uh, carbons to the hydrogen is a very strong bond. And if you can put the Brown's gas in there, it lowers the, uh, the energy necessary to break apart that bond. So they call that endothermic energy. It lowers the endothermic energy necessary to break apart the bond. So therefore, the exothermic energy, which is the energy left over after the fuel recombines the carbon to oxygen, making carbon dioxide, and the hydrogen to oxygen to make water. So when the, there's energy left over, so the amount of energy left over, the exothermic energy left over is more, and the engines are heat engines. These internal combustion engines are run by heat. So the more heat you can get from your fuel, the longer, the farther you can go on a gallon of gas. So if you're taking less of the heat to uh, maintain the combustion, uh, propagate the fuel, the combustion, then you have that heat to run the, run down the road. So putting a little bit of Brown's gas in causes the combustion efficiency to increase by lowering the amount of catalytically, lowering the amount of energy necessary to break apart the hydrogen carbon bonds. So you end up with extra heat. You end up with extra uh, miles per gallon kind of thing. So that's that's what the Hyzor was doing with Brown's gas 
So the Hyzor is a, a mini Brown's gas electrolyzer that's uh, powered by your alternator in your vehicle. And the amount of energy that it takes from the alternator is significantly less than the efficiency gain of the combustion of the fossil fuel that you're burning. I have a, a document that documents all of that. If anyone is interested, they can uh, email me at the contact page on our website uh, and, I, and I can send that document to them so they can have the, all the, the understanding of the math. And I also threw in a few links of those people that I was talking about that have run vehicles on water uh, in, into that document as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and I, yeah, that, I will mention, um, I, I bought, I think, three or four of those manuals, the high, a couple of the Hyzors, um, and then, um, yeah, I, I, I pretty much bought a couple of all the manuals, uh, a few of a few of all the manuals, and I've got a couple, a uh, couple of Pazians that come around here, very mechanically inclined. I'm trying to get them um, installing um, fuel saver kits or Hyzor kits um, for, for a lot of reasons, but I, I see it as a, like, looking, like, it's it seems like an endless... Um, but like a really, really good entrepreneurial opportunity uh, for like a van nomad. Just pull up to a truck stop and say, "Hey, I'm gonna like you want to you want to get you increase your fuel efficiency by twenty or twenty five percent for for such and like it's an unlimited market. So I think it'd be a really, really incredible opportunity, and also just to get the technology out there um, and yeah, get it yes. get it in use. There, there um, are companies out there that are selling uh, uh, Browns gas machines, but they're calling them hydrogen but it's Brown's gas uh, for truckers. So that, that is a, something that's available right now commercially. Uh, people can get those installed. I also have another technology called the HICO 2DT. So HICO stands for hydrocarbon oxygenator. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking the diesel fuel and vaporizing it and putting some of it into the intake of the air intake. And that pre-vaporized fuel helps uh, the efficiency of combustion in, once it goes into the uh, diesel, into the engine. And between those two and, and some water injection, the, uh, the, the diesel engines, even the large diesel engines, were using 50% less fuel, 50% less fuel. So that, that is a huge difference with the truckers. Now, as you get l uh, shorter hydrocarbon chains, because uh, diesel has a, a hydrocarbon chain of 12. Uh, octane, which is generally around gasoline, has a hydrocarbon chain of 8. You don't get the same catalytic effect with the Brown's gas as you do with the uh, uh, longer carbon chains because, again, it all works about by helping the uh, catalytically helping break apart the chains. So if there's a shorter and shorter chains, you end up with less and less gain. So if you're burning uh, methane, for example, uh, you get very little gain by adding Brown's gas, where you get a lot of gain by adding Brown's gas to uh, long chain hydrocarbons. So the um, getting back to the HICO 2DT, uh, all internal combustion engines run on vapor. If the fuel isn't vapor when the spark plug fires or the compression gets uh, compressed enough, it, it will not burn until it turns to vapor, mixes with oxygen, and then can combust. So a lot of the fuel in an internal combustion engine, and I'm going to talk about gasoline engines right now, mm -hmm. uh, would be burning as it goes out the exhaust because the initial, when the spark plug fires, the initial vaporized fuel would burn, turn the rest of the fuel that's still liquid into uh, uh, vapor, which then, then mix with oxygen and then start burning. But that takes about 25 milliseconds and you only have a, uh, less than that before really the engine, the exhaust valve opens. And so you're bur putting burning fuel out past the exhaust, which is why they say if you lean the fuel mixture, you'll burn your exhaust valves. So what they do is they add additional fuel to the internal combustion intake coming in, additional liquid fuel, so that when the fuel vaporizes after the initial combustion, the vapor fuel combustion, and it vaporizes the rest of the fuel, it actually makes the fuel too rich to burn. And we're, we're talking on the opposite side of what I was talking about with Brown's gas earlier, where you have a lower combustion limit with hydrogen. So if you have too little hydrogen in the air, it won't burn. In this case, we have too much fuel in the air and it actually floods the flame and, and puts the flame out so you don't have um, vapor, uh, a flame burning right out past your exhaust valves. But you have a whole lot of hydrocarbons running out past your exhaust valves. So my pet peeve is the catalytic converter that they put in the exhaust and they burn the fuel in the exhaust <laughs> instead of in the engine. This is crazy. So anyway, that's like I say, one of my pet peeves. I believe that it's better to burn the fuel in the engine. So as much of the fuel as possible that you can get vaporized before the spark plug fires, 
the more the fuel, uh, the longer, the farther you'll go on a gallon of gas, which brings us to the Heiko 2A technology. And people can buy the manual and build it themselves in their own garage. I, I don't sell the kits right now because I'm too busy selling aqua cures. But the, uh, the Heiko 2A is, a, is an evaporative system. So you're evaporating a portion of your fuel before it goes into the engine. Now, the reason it's important in, in this particular conversation is because I have a Heiko 2A on my uh, RV generator, which 100% provides vaporized fuel for the generator. So the generator is running on 100% uh, gasoline vapor uh, and, and it runs really well, full power, because that's all you're running on anyway is the gasoline vapors. So the, the thing is, I, I was running out of time and I really didn't uh, know, I, 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 was, I had this uh, Heiko sitting on the generator, but it was only running when the generator is running. So I thought, what I'll do is I'll make a dual system so that that same Heiko 2A system can be uh, feeding vapors into my uh, V10 uh, 6.8 liter uh, engine in the RV. And that RV at the time was getting 7.5, it was a 27 foot uh, Class C, uh, 20, uh, 7.5 miles per gallon. And that went to uh, almost 14. Uh, 13.8 miles to the gallon was simply by putting the vapors in with the Heiko 2A that I had been running just my generator on. So that uh, almost doubled the mileage. And if I ever get back to it, I'm probably going to end up selling that RV before I get back to it. <laughs> but hopefully I'll sell it to a guy who I know who will be able to uh, uh, finish off what I've started. And he's probably going to run that that vehicle in the 20 mile per gallon range. So we have a... Wow. Yes. We have a 27 foot class C uh, with a 6.0 liter V10 uh, Triton engine in it that'll be getting 20 miles to the gallon full power and the engine won't be having the carbon buildups and all that kind of stuff in it. That That's absolutely possible. No problem whatsoever. I'm sure there's a market for that. You're not going to have any problem finding somebody who wants something like that. Yes, no, I'm, not. I'm not a one trick pony. I got lots of ways of making money, that's for sure. But the idea is to help as many people as possible. And right now I'm, I'm really concentrating on this health application with the, with the Browns gas because so many people need it. These days, mm -hmm. so many people, health is just that huge, huge, huge issue. If you, if you haven't got your health, you've got nothing. With your health, you can, you can do a lot of things. You can make money. You can, you can apply these technologies and have fun in your shop. If you haven't got your health, you've got nothing. That's true. And we do uh, use it for health and wellness daily. And uh, we have testified to that in the past. I think with the last, the first time we talked to you, we gave our testimonials as to how it worked for each of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't stress that enough that the health and wellness aspects of this are, uh, are not only worth a look, but there's even more behind that as well as uh, fuel efficiency and, uh, and so forth. So there's, there's lots of different applications, but the, the, the most primary of which is health and wellness. At, at, at this time, that's where my focus is. But I'm telling you, it's a lot of fun to make those semi-precious stones. And and then we got to get into that transmutation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's yep. so, many, uh, so many aspects of Brown's gas. It's absolutely incredible. And then when people have, all the people have this thing in their own home, it'll become ubiquitous. It, everybody can do this this sort of stuff all the time. But just, the knowledge just has to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most certainly. Um, and I, I guess I'll, um, it's interesting. I, I, I bring up, uh, I brought up hydrogen to Matt Presti and, um, or I guess Brown's gas, you know, fuel saver kits. And he was like, oh yeah, I knew someone 20 years ago that did that. And, um, when we talked to Sky Huddleston and he's familiar with, um, he's, he's familiar with you. Um, and, um, yeah, he's, he testified to, you know, testified to it as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, and Sky also, it was, it was great to get, um, from your vantage point talking, talking about the, uh, I guess the hydrocarbon thing. Cause I really hadn't ever had that explained to me. And that's what he said is the, the carbon and the carbon's just there to make the, to stabilize, to stabilize the hydrogen so you can burn it. Um, then you break those bonds apart and burn the, you know, burn, burn the hydrogen anyway. So, the, so the, both, both explanations were really, really well, uh, really good. And that's, it's gonna be valuable for the, for the audience. Um, and also the explaining the huge inefficiencies present in modern internal co combustion engines. He had, uh, he had a similar, um, <laughs> a similar attitude against it. And it makes sense. It's, it's, you know, design massive inefficiencies that could very easily be corrected. And, um, as, yeah, as you said, um, they've had that Mercedes and companies like that have had, have had 
uh, patents for these things since like 1920s, 19, you know, early 1900s. So um, things should definitely not be the way that they are now. And um, hydrogen provides a lot. Hydrogen, Brown's gas, these things, this, it, this, this, this alone. Um, and there are plenty of other options too. I mean, you got a magnetic motor back there in addition and Sky's Bork engine, which um, will be interesting. I think he's going to be doing some, some Brown's gas testing on that at some point. He's excited to do that. Um, but um, yeah, if you aren't familiar with Sky Huddleston, you should check him out too. Um, he's, uh, yeah, he's got a lot. Uh, he's, he's also, he's also got a, a liberated rocket heater company and, um, he's working on a Tesla turbine. Um, so you could, you could heat your house and power your house, um, at like 99% efficiency, um, with a Tesla turbine. So there, there's a lot of really incredible possibilities, but again, I always come back to hydrogen or Brown's gas cause, um, it's the most versatile, um, you know, basically every, every, every application in life, it's, it's of massive value. So, um, I guess, um, I'm not sure if I had any other questions, um, Oh, I guess just one one final question that I guess comes to mind. Um, you can add these fuel saver kits to things like propane tanks, right? Um, could you talk a little bit about a little, a little bit about that? Because we've got uh, we've got propane here as a backup. Um, so if we could, you know, you know, increase the efficiency efficiency of that by twenty percent or so, that'd be be worthwhile. Uh, so you're running a propane to run an internal combustion engine as backup? Um, no, no, for the house. Sorry, for the for our, our uh, for our uh, for the heat, and then Furnace. we're also going to get, um, um, I guess, uh, propane fridge, um, I guess as well, um, in the new, uh, in the new embassy too. So, um, yeah, for a lot of applications. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can add the Browns gas to again. It's like that increasing the internal combustion efficiency. So that's those are external combustion uh, technologies. But yes, you can increase the efficiency of the external combustion heaters, uh, propane fridge, stoves, all those kind of things by adding the Brown's gas in with the uh, natural gas or propane, whatever it happens to be that you are running those systems on as well. I, I have done that. My shop, uh, my not this current one, but the last one I had was running with uh, natural gas as a heating source for when I was in the city. And I did add that. Uh, <laughs> again, I never tell anybody I'm doing this. Like the landlord did not know, <laughs> and the and the utility and stuff. But I added this uh, uh, Brown's gas to it. And the nice thing about it is it eliminates the yellow flames. Like you could even see that in a in a tiger torch. Like when you when you do a tiger torch, uh, you can see the yellowness in the flame where you get your inefficient combustion when the carbon is burning and burns yellow. And when you add the Brown's gas, it'll turn it into a light blue flame with a nice white uh, uh, core and you can you can adjust the amount of browns gas so you get almost perfect combustion and of course then you're getting your perfect heat and everything else out of out of the uh, flame so yes uh, adding the browns gas to that is a is a good idea uh, there are browns gas stoves that are just running browns gas itself but again it's one of those things that it's relatively inefficient because if you're going to use electricity to make a gas that then makes heat, why not just use the electricity directly to make the heat? <laughs> it's a whole lot less expensive mm -hmm. and, and simpler. But if you already have the uh, um, gas in place and, and what you're doing is enhancing the combustion of the gas, mm -hmm. yes, I believe that Brown's gas is a very uh, um, appropriate uh, uh, way to increase the efficiency. And then we get back to the standalone generators like the people have diesel uh, there's a lot of places where they, they only get their diesel on islands and stuff. They get their, their electricity with diesel generators. And if you add the Browns gas along with the uh, Hyco 2 DT technology, so you're getting that vaporization of, in fact, a diesel engine, you can literally run without the diesel injection system at all. You can just put vapor uh, fuel in with the, I've done this vapor fuel in and, and adjust the vapor fuel that's going in the air intake of the diesel engine. So it's 100% vapor fuel mm. and the diesel engine will run just fine. No problem, full power and you'll get double or triple your fuel mileage on the diesel fuel. If you vape, pre vaporize it and put it into the uh, air, go, air intake going in. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. You don't even need fuel uh, injection, the diesel injection system at all. So those are, and then, and then you add the water fog and, uh, and now you can't do the plasma injection in the diesel, but you can do it in the gasoline engines. Uh, you get further efficiencies of combustion. So there's, there's a lot of things that can be done out there that they just aren't doing because the powers that be want you to burn as much fuel as possible. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. Why else would they pump extra fuel in? So you burn it in the exhaust. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's it's definitely nuts. But uh, thankfully, the solutions are here and um, they're getting out there. Um, thanks to folks like you, George. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have any other questions, Bueller. I'll give you another another chance. You got any uh, other questions or comments for George before we uh, wrap it up? No, I think that covers most of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, it does look like there's going to be a little bit more work involved to increase the efficiency, but I think we'll get there someday soon. Agreed. And, and that's what it takes. It takes consistency, persistence and consistency and stuff gets done. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. For sure. So George, thanks so much for coming back on. Um, any, any other closing thoughts for the listeners before I let you go? Uh, just, uh, you guys have a discount code, if I remember correctly, Correct. I just want yep. to make sure that people, they can go to aquacure.life. So aquacure.life, L-I-F-E. And then they can learn a whole lot more about the health aspect of Brown's gas. And then they can click on that link and, and use your code mm -hmm. and they can uh, purchase their own machine. And again, uh, for you guys, we did a 20% discount, which is about almost $500 off. Mm -hmm. And then we send you guys a bit of a commission as well. So you guys... Anybody buying an AquaCure through you would not only get a discount, but help you guys out with your own bills too. Yep. Yep. And that's greatly appreciated. And the, the coupon code we is VONU, uh, V O N U. Um, so uh, definitely go get it. I mean, um, yeah, I've, I've used it pretty much every day for, there was, there was about a month, maybe around May or June last year, where I didn't use it every single day, but now it's an, every, it's, I, and I, I breathe for hours, um, hours daily. And yeah, again, the, the water's uh, unmatched, um, it is absolutely unmatched. So, um, yeah, that can't can't recommend it enough. It'll, it'll be a staple at the wellness center here for forever. But uh, um, thanks again, George yeah. Bueller. It was uh, it was great. Um, and there you have it, guys. George Wiseman. Um, again, uh, just uh, yeah. Uh, so you can go to um, aquacure life, um, or if you want to go to vonniepodcast dot com forward slash aqua, that'll take you there as well. And use uh, coupon code vonni. It'll save you save you about five hundred bucks, and uh, you will be um, helping uh, helping us here at uh, Pasadena Department of Health and Wellness as well. Um, thanks for tuning in, and thanks again to George for coming on. Uh, VaniPodcast.com is the place to go for all things Vanu. Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com for all things the free republic. And uh, finally, LibertyUnderAttack.com for solutions and uh, freedom-oriented books. Uh, and on that note, we are now accepting new publishing clients. Uh, so if you're an author looking for help with the publishing process, uh, please visit LibertyUnderAttack.com forward slash publish uh, to view our services and rates. And uh, feel free to uh, send me an email to start the discussion. Uh, Shane at LibertyUnderAttack. Dot com again shane at liberty uh, thanks guys always remember vano is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building cheers 2048 the second volume in the Brushfire thriller series takes place in the not so distant future in the second half of the 21st century the war of ideas took place the creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions and the practical ideas of liberty voluntary interaction and peace took hold the Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the Freedom Cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been van nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? 
Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.